Welcome into another episode of the Young Turks Podcast. I'm Ed Gaffier and Mason Viner. It is Locksmiths, a couple days before Christmas, but it's Locksmiths. I'm Ed uh, Terps bringing a haul, a signing day flip, and let's dig into this class. Yeah, it's been a very hectic day, um, and uh, I think a lot of people were hoping that, you know, maybe by the Loxy press conference at 3.30, uh, we'd get some uh, clarity on the potential full class, uh, but unfortunately, that is not the case with the biggest target uh, still remaining out there, so we'll dive into it all. Yeah, let's talk about, let's start it off. I know everybody that's probably clicking on this episode wants to hear this part of it, so we'll just, we'll address it right away. Uh, Jordan Seaton, the top tackle in the class, the five-star current Colorado verbal. Uh, Ahmed, w- what is going on at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's been pretty fun to, to, to kind of see um, and just like all the, the Twitter buzz and all that, just kind of people talking about Maryland, how they're a factor and things like that, um, you know. Uh, I'll say this, you know, the, the, the confidence kind of just from what I've heard uh, really throughout or excuse me, since the weekend um, has been steady, has been consistent. Um, and the, the messaging really has never changed. Um, of course, you know, it's a, the, the five star blue chip guy and you're in a in a dog fight against, you know, Deion Sanders. Uh, but, um, you know, it, Maryland has is a very realistic chance here. Um, obviously, this goes way deeper than just you know football. Obviously, you know Mike Loxley way back when uh, Maryland ended up being the first offer for uh, Jordan Seaton during his freshman year. Um, Loxley has run point in this recruitment throughout, um, and that relationship between Mike Loxley and uh, Jordan Seaton, Jordan Seaton's family, you know that runs deep. Um, what I will say is, you know, I kind of posted it for inside the black and gold subscribers as well, but really feels like Dion's just trying to throw everything, you know, kind of the kitchen sink at Jordan, um, really make him say no. Uh, it's from, you know, from the sounds of it going into uh, about seven o'clock, uh, what I was hearing was, you know, felt like Jordan Seaton's camp was just kind of trying to navigate it a little bit and, you know, um, Maryland again, you know, was was is still in it there. Um, obviously, you know, the reports this evening that Jordan Seaton's not going to end up signing today. Uh, I mentioned, you know, timing on when Jordan Seaton signs kind of still remains fluid. Uh, I believe uh, Adam Freeman of Rivals mentioned, you know, I had a quote from a source and said decision made and uh, or I love my decision, but um, obviously we don't know where the decision is. And uh, the one thing that we do know that is decided is that they are not signing on Wednesday. So um, I just feel comfortable, you know, at this point, uh, I don't want to officially go on the record and say Jordan Seaton is going to Maryland. Um, but I feel a little bit more comfortable that uh, Jordan Seaton goes to Maryland than he does go to Colorado. Maryland's in a dogfight in this one. Uh, Mike Loxley is doing everything. And um, I mean, this, this this goes deep, you know, I mean, Mike Loxley talked about just the, the manpower, the effort that goes into keeping recruits that are in, in the fold for months and upon months. Um, and it takes, you know, it's a lot more than just, you know, one coach keeping contact with them, a lot of manpower. So a lot of manpower, a lot of effort, um, coordinated efforts from really everyone uh, inside College Park. Um, the best advice I'd give for any Maryland fan that's out there, um, just frankly, let locks cook. Uh, that's just kind of how it is. It's going to be a battle. Um, but the two teams I'm hearing continue to be Maryland and Colorado. Yeah, down the line. And, you know, obviously there there's others looming in the background that have plenty of money. Obviously, Dion's NIL. It's uh, up there, I, I really I, you don't at this point really know what to make of Deion Sanders because they certainly, uh, you talked about the Twitter battle, they have some delusional fans for a team that was four and eight this year that lost the last six. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's just kind of just um, the the brand and kind of the mantra. I mean, not, you know, a shot, but I think it's pretty clear to everyone that kind of looks at Colorado, sees just how they kind of go about everything. It's just the glitz, the glamour, the flash. Um, And that's fine. You know, that's, you know, that's their strategy. That's their method. But, um, you know, uh, maybe it sounds cliche, but Maryland's just kind of grinding in silence on this one. But um, yeah, you know, in terms of NIL, again, look, you talk about recruiting NIL, tamper, all that look like the NIL, the, the three positions are quarterback, uh, your, your blindside tackle uh, and a premier edge rusher, defensive end. Those are your top three guys with the quarterback and and your tackle being the the highest paid guys. So NIL is playing a hand here. I'm just not sure that it's. I don't think it'll be the 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 sole tipping 
tip, tipping point in this recruitment. Um, but we'll see. Uh, I've never been offered seven figures, so I, I can't say that. Uh, I can't say that for certainty. Yeah, I, I was talking to some people in the know in the college football world this week, just with everything coming up, and obviously. You know, it's like the portal with NIL. It seems like everything portal wise, you all you hear about the NIL, but the high school recruiting, you know, it's there at the top end. Obviously, the positions that you mentioned are always there. But when a guy like this comes down to it, it's really what goes into that decision is dependent on what that camp is. It could be I need to make as much money right now as possible because I don't know what's going to happen next. Football is not not a predictive sport in, in any sort of sort of the matter. And look at a guy. I mean, Deshaun Harris Smith right now. I'm sure somebody could have been selling him that, you know, he would be lottery NBA draft pick by right now, top 20 NBA guy, and it's not there yet. So, you know, that money is probably going to carry him in that case. But with a guy like a Jordan Seaton, where there's so much more on the table, the decision means, you know, a ton. He could make a couple seven figures in, in the next couple of years, but then we all know how much legitimate big time NFL left tackles, right tackles make yeah. at this point. So, there's a lot into it. It depends on always what game they're playing. And that's where, you know, you said it, let locks cook. That's where he's always been the master in Maryland in these past couple of years. They have everything that says they can put an offensive lineman in the league, which they did multiple of which last year, guys, they're getting starting time uh, as rookies with the guy like Jalen Duncan, even though he's not playing the best, he's still starting left tackle in the NFL right now. And that list, as long as that list keeps growing, you're a really hard guy to beat on the recruiting trail. Yeah. And again, you know, like I said, I feel like it's uh, it's worth emphasizing. You know, this one is there's a reason that Locks is running point on this. Um, you know, this is this is this is Locks's mission this this cycle. So uh, whether it comes to fruition, we'll see. But again, you know, the, the, the confidence is there um, and we are prepared. So, yes, yeah. we sure are. Let's look at the rest of the fold that's started off on the offensive line. Ahmed Terps bring in a ton of talent on the offensive line. Let's start off with a local guy, Ryan Howardson. Yeah, big guy. Obviously, he got a chance to commit over West Virginia and Pitt uh, back in the summer. I believe that was in late July. Uh, six foot four, 295 pound uh, lineman. Um, I think he could play guard or tackle, um, but I think he's a guy that um, I, I think if, if kind of all goes well, he, he could slot into that right tackle spot. But again, I think with this offensive line, I think one it's really important to just kind of stress. Um, the, the positional, the, the flexible versatility, uh, positional versatility, excuse me. Um, but again, you know, Howerton, Therese Davis, those are really the two guys that kind of uh, highlight the current offensive line haul this uh, so far. But um, he'll head to the Under Armour All-American game on January 3rd. Um, and again, you know, I think this is a really good guy. He was able to kind of start at Pilates these last couple of years. And um, the, the the strength and the power that he has, the motor, um, is all evident. Um, and again, you know, he, I think that just kind of off the field when you talk about intangibles and whatnot, uh, I think Howerton kind of has it. So I thought that was a really big win over Maryland, or excuse me, for Maryland uh, over the summer. Um, and really never wavered despite, you know, having a good season and uh, obviously drawing the uh, Under Armour All-American game invite. Yeah, let's keep it local. Let's go over to Loyola Blakefield, a similar last name that Terp fans are going to rec recognize. Uh, they land uh, the brother of one of the players with uh, Trevor Zizmanski. Yeah, uh, one of the last uh, local linemen to jump into the fold, a six foot five, two hundred and seventy five pound lineman. Um, right now, I think he's another guy that he kind of projects inside as well. But uh, opted for Pitt, or excuse me, opted for Maryland over Pitt, Virginia Tech, Syracuse um, was a guy that I expected going into June when you know, obviously official visits really start to pick up. Uh, I expected him to take an official. Um, Syracuse was really in the picture there as well. Boston College seemed like it were in the picture um, a little bit early on in the process, but frankly, this was. Maryland, as long as, um, you know, Maryland, you know, both sides were kind of on the same page, um, obviously with AJ, his older brother, uh, being when his first year, wrapping up his first year with the program, um, it was kind of always going to be Maryland for him. So uh, just kind of a perfect match there. Um, and he was a guy that, you know, again, you know, when they were recruiting AJ, um, when AJ was a senior, uh, Trevor's name came up a bunch. So I think he's a guy, don't don't know that I necessarily view him as maybe a guy that can come in right away and be an, an immediate impact guy, uh, immediate two deep guy, uh, but at 6'5", 275 pounds. Uh, Locks, you mentioned, you know, you get a chance to bring him in, um, get these guys over 300 pounds and then kind of work from there. So uh, Sismanski will enroll in June. Let's keep it 
over in Baltimore. Logan Bennett, a guy that we've talked about a lot on this show over the past couple of weeks, finally uh, ops with the Terps. Yeah, this one was pretty much done since the Penn State game. I remember talking to him the day after, and um, he pretty much was like, yeah, you know, I'm I'm pretty much only focused on Maryland. And then I was like, okay. Uh, about a month after that, I got a text and said, hey, you know, uh, we're checking with Logan Bennett. He might be heading our way. And I was like, yeah, I think he is. Uh, but I think he's a really good guy. Again, you know, I posted on the site for uh, Inside the Black and Gold subscribers, but uh, six foot six, 305 pounds. He was a name that really came up beginning of his junior year. Um, was previously committed to Michigan State. Was committed to Michigan State, actually, while he – uh, took a visit to Maryland for the Penn State game. That wasn't unofficial. Um, but again, once the Mel Tucker, once that whole situation kind of unfolded, uh, Bennett reopened his recruitment a little bit more. Um, and Maryland, again, was kind of lurking, was showing interest, and uh, was kind of a perfect match and became official once he took his official visit the weekend of December 8th. And Bennett will be the, among the early signees who are uh, joining the team uh, tomorrow yeah last one out of the baltimore area on the offensive line uh devon watkins from saint mary's yeah another guy he actually uh jumped in the season opening weekend i believe it was that monday tuesday i believe it was monday night he announced uh six foot five 315 pound lineman um he got a chance to pick up his offer back in the spring, or excuse me, back in uh, June uh, when he came for the big man camp. I believe it was that first weekend of June. Um, and actually, Loxie talked about that a lot. And, and I think this is actually a good time to bring this up. I think uh, the, the the message or maybe the, the, the mindset about camp offers, bringing in a guy to work out, has kind of shifted from what it is now versus five, six years ago. I think five, six years ago, it kind of had this connotation that, you know, camp guys are fringe guys, but, you know, this Maryland staff does a really good job of wanting to bring in a lot of these guys, whether it is for an official, you know, big man's camper, just come, come be able to work out, uh, obviously when it's permissible to do so, uh, but just be able to get a closer look at these guys, work with them, um, see, see kind of how they work. And obviously, uh, like I said, Watkins was able to pick up that offer uh, way back when I uh, took an unofficial visit, I believe it was July 29th. Uh, and again, you know, Maryland was similar to Trevor Szymanski was kind of the school that he always wanted to be at and uh, gave his commitment that uh, that Towson weekend and uh, announced days later. Yeah, last uh, local offensive lineman out of the state of Maryland, you mentioned him. He's been I think he's the steal of the class, Therese Davis from DeMatha. Yeah, uh, the son of uh, NBA guard Ricky Davis uh, was a uh, favorite player of mine when I was a kid. So it's uh, that was a pretty pretty cool full, full circle moment, I guess you could say. But uh, when you talk about again, you know, I, I think he was probably one of the best hidden gems uh, in the DMV, really going into the spring. Uh, really, a guy when you look at him, just the perfect type of guy. Really, that Maryland should have had the core of its class around, but you just kind of look at his ascension, uh, really through his senior year, and it's easy to see why he's become. Um, an undoubted cornerstone and, and uh, uh, prominent figure in this class, uh, six foot five, two hundred ninety pounds. Um, he's another guy where I could see him probably slotting inside. Uh, but Penn State was the school that was on him very, very, very hard. Uh, Florida, Auburn was also showing interest as well. Syracuse was also giving, or excuse me, was showing interest uh, earlier in the process. It seemed like Fran Brown was hitting uh, not just the DMV, but he was hitting a couple of these Maryland commits pretty hard to hurt. Uh, they they came up with Brandon Jacob as well, but um, Davis really never wavered. Um, him and Ryan Howerton, social media, if you follow them, uh, they're very outspoken, trying to recruit, trying to help build Maryland, trying to, to bring more guys aboard. Uh, first team all met selection. I uh, think this is a, a really quality addition. Um, and again, you know, played tight end and defensive end going into, uh, excuse me, as a junior made that full-time transition to offensive line because that's where a lot of coaches saw him projecting at the next level. And uh, the athleticism, obviously, with his basketball background, um, it's very easy to see why so many kind of look at him and um, see him as a guy that can really make an impact uh, down the line. Yeah, then Maryland heads up 83, and they get three guys uh, out of that PA, PA area. Let's start off with uh, Michael Hershey. Yep, uh, one of the guys, six foot five, two hundred seventy-five pound lineman. Um, I think he was a guy that a lot of people looked at as a guy that could potentially, um, you know, when you talk about positional versatility, whether it's 
you know, inside guard, center, tackle. Um, I think people kind of looked at Hershey as a guy that could potentially switch to the defensive side of the ball and play defensive line. But Maryland now him as an offensive lineman today, uh, six foot five, two hundred and seventy five pound uh, lineman from Spring Grove Area High School. Um, and he's a guy that, you know, very similar. A couple of the, the, the PA linemen, you know, they're just guys that really stuck out in camp. Um, and Hershey was no different, you know, a guy that really has the upside, moves really well, very fluid for that six foot five frame. So um, the, when, when you kind of look at this room, I think fans, you know, when you look at the 2024 starting offensive line, you say, oh, wow, we need to hit the portal. But I think what this hall is kind of doing is saying, hey, in two, three years, you know, you don't have to go to the portal to potentially find four new starters. So um, I think Hershey's a guy with high upside. And again, I think he has all the intangibles uh, off the field to, to help make him a, su- a successful college football player. Yeah. Terps uh, go into York, Pennsylvania, and they get Michael McMongle. Uh, definitely got a lot of size here and, and another piece uh, for the future. Yeah. Six foot six, 290 pound uh, guy. I think, I think this is a guy where you could uh, pencil, pencil him in as a tackle. Uh, Maryland was able to top Syracuse for him uh, back in the, back in June. He was another guy who came in for camp, uh, was able to come in for a midweek unofficial visit. Uh, Mike Loxley had a good connection. Uh, I believe he played with his uh, McMonagall's coach uh, back in the day um, to kind of get Maryland in there. So uh, McMonagall took an unofficial visit heading into the Syracuse official. And then one week later returned to Maryland for a special visit where he locked in. So again, another guy where I think he's high upside guy. He gets a chance to enroll in June uh, similar to uh, Michael Hershey um, and kind of help, help mold and, and kind of reshape the, uh, the future of the room. Yeah, and finishing out the huge offensive line hall for Maryland, uh, Anthony Robsock. Yeah, and also known as the first guy who sent in his letter of intent today. So we uh, got a little nice text about that from his position coach. But uh, six foot six, two hundred eighty pound lineman, uh, wrestling background, sixty plus pancakes blocks uh, as a high schooler. Um, was named team captain as a senior. Was an all comp all conference selection as a senior as well. Um, and again, I mentioned the, 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 the wrestling background is dead. Uh, also wrestled, I uh, was a team captain at West Virginia way back in the day. Um, uh, excuse me for, um, for football, excuse me. Uh, but again, you know, Rob Sopp, they coming for camp was able to kind of really jump out uh, for Maryland. So at 6'6", 280 pounds, um, again, gold to kind of get him over to that 300 pound mark. So I think, you know, just a couple of these guys, you know, get them into the strength and conditioning program um, and kind of see how that, you know, too deep shakes out in uh, in year two, year three. Yeah. And the guy that they'll be protecting down the road, let's bounce it over to the Terps lone quarterback commit, Christian Martin. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to look at many players that are uh, – you know, have less of a less wins than what Christian Martin did. Obviously, at Highland Springs, I believe he finished with just one loss, and that came uh, in his last game as a in his high school career. Obviously, committed to Maryland over Virginia. Virginia Tech was also somewhat in the mix, but it was primarily Virginia. Um, this was a big win because uh, Latrell Scott. Um, it was kind of running point on this. Uh, towards the end, obviously, once he joined the staff uh, last February, but uh, Merrill was tracking Christian uh, back when Enos uh, was on the staff, was able to go see him a couple times his junior year. Um, so a guy they were definitely very familiar with, a uh, guy that um, rose on the on the uh, target list through the spring. Um, and obviously when Mike Van Buren, once he uh, popped for Oregon, um, the, the focus really really focusing on uh, on Christian Martin. He came in, I believe it was that first weekend of June. Um, it was a big seven on seven on campus and got a chance to connect with pretty much the whole staff. I mean, I got a chance to was walking out and saw Christian Martin talking with Josh Gaddis um, with his family as well. So um, again, just a really good guy, great grades as well. Um, I think that the, 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 the the, the traits that you want in a quarterback is what Christian Martin has. So um, I talked to a source about him earlier in the summer, uh, kind of to see, hey, you know, what, where do you kind of see him? Um, they kind of described it as a poor man's Byron Leftwich. So I think that that's kind of a uh, a good comparison there. So, um, again, you know, uh, MJ Morris is not officially signed in yet. And, you know, Cam Edge, Billy Edwards will get a chance to kind of compete for the starting job next year. So um, we'll see. But uh, Christian Martin will get in there in June. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, kind of elevates the future of the room. Let's talk about some of his future targets. We'll stay in Virginia and start it off with uh, a recruitment that had a little bit of drama coming down the wire, Makai White. Yeah, uh, he's another guy. He had 
Virginia lurking uh, in the end, Arkansas as well. Uh, Virginia Tech, Tennessee, Michigan, we're all kind of monitoring, showing interest through the season. And White kind of kept the door open a little bit, um, but really felt like it was just kind of, you know, just letting schools just kind of make their pitches and whatnot. But it didn't really feel like there was a necessarily true concern that White was going to, you know, ultimately flip for Maryland. Um, But again, you know, six foot three, 185 pound wide out. Um, He's another guy that he'll be expected to join the team uh, beginning Thursday uh, for bowl practices. And again, what that looks like, pretty much you guys, once they're cleared and once they pass, you know, all the test protocols, all that, you know, they'll be able to practice, be able to travel town uh, with the team for the bowl game, but they just won't be able to play in the bowl game. So uh, just really gives gives them a chance to to kind of get ahead of the curve a little bit. But um, again, I think, you know, Makai White, I think he's a great guy. I think he can kind of play outside a bit. Uh, I think he has um, the the catch radius and the bounce. Um, think that he he has a chance to kind of flourish as an underclassman uh, finished with over 1300 yards. 62 receptions, 19 touchdowns during his senior year. Um, also played a little bit of defensive back safety uh, through his high school career as well. So and basketball as well, where Maryland uh, was able to to kind of watch him in action a couple times last off season and and kind of once they really started to pick up recruiting him. Yeah, next up, one of my favorite guys in the class, uh, track star, a guy on the football field that plays running back and wide receiver. Seems like a guy that uh, Locks has really started to target with. It's, with his offense, Josiah McLaurin from uh, Clinton, North Carolina. Yeah, and he was uh, that was a pro- slight surprise, I guess, just getting announced as a running back. But uh, I think that's a guy that you know you look at really how Brandon Wazowski was described a year ago. A guy that you just kind of find ways to get him in space, whether it's you know motioning out of the backfield, motion in the slot. Um, think that's kind of how McLaurin would kind of get used. You know, just kind of a versatile uh, jack of all trades. Uh, in that offense again you know he's uh, another guy um he'll get here i believe in june um but uh pick maryland over virginia tech uh pit as well um and maryland announced that he had a catapult verified speed of 22.83 miles per hour uh during their workout as well so um definitely when you look about just the speed and, and putting a premium on that in recruiting for their skill players uh, mclaurin definitely fits that bill so uh, i tweeted earlier uh in, during the signing day but i think mclaurin is just just like Wazowski, I think that it, it's going to be a very exciting player to watch in Maryland's offense. And the Terps, of course, bring it back to the DMV, the last uh, wide receiver in the class, Jamari powell Wonson. Yeah, he was the first wide receiver to jump into the fold at six foot, 285 pounds. He's another guy, you know, I mentioned uh, Therese Davis and Ryan Howerton, who were uh, vocal in their recruiting efforts. And Jamari was just like that. Um, very productive receiver uh, over at City College. Uh, posted 32 catches, uh, 1,100 all-purpose yards, 13 touchdowns this year. So, um, and he posted 1,100 all-purpose yards last year as well. So, I um, think this is a guy, he, he, he's kind of able to um, just really get catch radius. And I think he can, uh, has proven that he can win the one-on-one battles, especially in the red zone. Yeah, we'll stay in the backfield. Uh, I guess it's the second running back in the class since Maryland uh, count, counts Josiah McLaurin as their first one. Uh, Dejon Williams, uh, another pickup from uh, St. Francis. Yeah, that yeah, he's a good good looking player. It's uh, you know he's bat- battling back from his ACL injury, so I think you know once he gets on campus, so it'll be kind of interesting to see you know just how involved, how um, you know how hard they kind of work him. Um, but it sounds like he, he's kind of trending back and close to that 100% mark. Um, really unfortunate injury, though. Uh, I was at the spring game, and uh, they were ready to end the spring game. And they were like, no, we'll run one more drive. And it was like three or four plays later, uh, Devon Williams went down. Initially, I mean, he was. I watched the whole thing. He went on a stretcher, was able to walk it off. It looked like it was just kind of a stinger. Um, yeah, and a couple of days later, news that emerged that he tore his ACL. So that's uh, that's a tough blow there. but. Um, again, I think this is a guy that when you looked at this position at the beginning of the cycle, Dewan Williams, Dylan Jones, those were the two names that Maryland would have loved to add both of those guys. And if they got one of them, they would have been happy with them. Um, so he's one of the uh, early enrollees for Maryland as well. Uh, big Maryland over Michigan, Ohio State, Virginia Tech, Penn State uh, among his verbal offers as well. So uh, and it's always good to add from St. Francis. It definitely is. Let's flip sides of the ball. Let's start off def- defensive backs for Maryland. Uh, obviously, they make the big splash. And let's talk about him first, Braden Lee. Yeah, uh, obviously. I mean, I got a chance to talk to Braden. I have a really good story 
uh, by the time you're listening to this, you probably had a chance to read it already, but really good story with Braden, uh, Lloyd Irvin, uh, with Braden Lee's mom as well. Um, and this was a really big recruitment. Um, you know, I, if you remember, if you're, you know, a subscriber, you know, going into or at the halfway point of, uh, Braden Lee's junior season, uh, if you recall, uh, I mentioned that I was not very optimistic on Maryland's chance with the Braden Lee. Um, and that was around the time that Nick Harbor was rumored to be considering or very close to transferring to Flowers. Um, there were a lot of rumblings that Braden Lee, Desmond Umiozulu, um, and Nick Harbor were all going to go play together at South Carolina. So there were a lot of things that uh, early on made it seem like Maryland, at best, they would finish second, but it felt like a distant second. And um, it's been a, a dramatic year, you know. Braden's been through a lot. Um, obviously, in the spring, um, he lost his dad. Uh, and that's just, you know, just a lot to go through as a 17-year-old. Um, so I, th I would definitely caution and say that this was really deeper than football. Um, really, what I heard down the stretch was it wasn't, you know, Maryland, South Carolina, SEC, Big Ten. It was more making sure that Braden was going to be in good hands. Um, and, you know, I heard that there was – kind of an emphasis on saying, hey, you know, Braden uh, getting out of this area could be good for him. Um, and it was just kind of Maryland saying, hey, you know, you can leave, but you don't need to in order to grow. And I think that was, um, you know, Henry Baker, uh, he did, did a really good job of really connecting with Braden. And it really felt like Braden was on board uh, before the decision was finalized, before everyone was, before really mom signed off on it. Um, and he was transparent about that with me going into or coming out of his official visit. He said this weekend was really about my mom, having her see it, having her be around the coaching staff, having her see what I see. Um, and, you know, I um, think they did a really good job with that uh, six foot, 175 pound corner. Um, I think he fits in perfectly as a nickel guy. And uh, I mentioned it as a couple with a couple of these early enrollees. Uh, once he clears everything, he should be able to join the team uh, immediately for uh, bowl practices. Yeah, and as well his teammate Lloyd Irvin, also from Flowers. Yeah, he was a guy. He uh, can't remember his other finalists, but Wisconsin, or, excuse me, West Virginia and, and, and uh, Virginia Tech were his other two finalists. Uh, but the primary contender there was Wisconsin uh, for Maryland, and I think Maryland just did a really good job. He came in during that big June twenty third official visit weekend, and uh, again, you know, Lloyd Irvin. I tweeted out a, a quote from Lloyd just. Baker's presence was the driving force here. Kevin Sumlin did a really good job. It has done a really good job Green down in, uh, in Tampa and PG County. But I um, think, think Henry Baker um, just kind of think it's a balance between how he interacts with players and just how he coaches. Um, and just Braden and, and Lloyd just kind of fit that to a T, just kind of mesh with him and have been able to build a very strong rapport. So I think once Maryland was able to get Lloyd on campus, um, that was kind of a done deal. Yeah, rounding out. I will add uh, Lloyd coming on board. Wouldn't it wasn't um it wouldn't say it was a, a deciding factor, maybe tip the scale. Like I wouldn't say that with for Braden Lee's ultimate decision, but it didn't help. Or excuse me, it didn't hurt. Excuse me. Um Lloyd was always just kind of in his ear, just kind of getting him comfortable with Maryland. So I think that was another another um thing that Maryland kind of had in its corner. Yeah, possibly the steal of the class with our next guy from Good Counsel over an only Judah Jenkins who co who commits to the Terps uh, on signing day. Yeah, that was a uh, late, late ad. Um, it seemed like just kind of talking to a couple people, it seemed like kind of that kind of all came to fruition really over the last 48 hours or so. But, um, you know, my initial reaction was, and I expected it to kind of be a, um, a, a, a contingency plan to Larry Tarver flipping to Nebraska on signing day. But it doesn't really feel like that's really a consensus, and I don't think that would be a 100% accurate statement. Um, Judah Jenkins, he was a guy that um, Maryland really liked. You know, Loxley, it's kind of hard for, you know, I mean, he spoke pretty glowingly, just he's a, just a dude. Um, and I think the way that Judah Jenkins is described now, and I talk just about how Jalen Husky was described two years ago, just as a pure football player, like the, the exact same. They're both just very instinctive, just pure football players. Um, and I think that both of those guys just kind of have the good head on their shoulders to be able to kind of come and contribute. But like Judah, um, I mean, he wanted to be at Maryland, uh, but I, I thought it was pretty interesting to hear that uh, Coach Stefanelli was kind of really working on this and, and kind of kept it uh, a surprise from Judah and kind of 
let it be, you know, hey, you know, Maryland is sending you an NLI and that's kind of how it came to fruition in the final hour. But, you know, Maryland, you know, they, they liked him. They were evaluating him. Good counsel was pushing him and advocating for Judah Jenkins to get to Maryland. And like I said, Judah wanted to get to Maryland. So really just ended up being a perfect match. Uh, cornerback was a position to need. And um, once Larry Tarver did it, I think it just, you know, further accentuated that uh, Judah needed to come into the fold. Yeah, the Terps also pick up two defensive backs out of Florida. Let's start off with Lakai Rowland. Uh, yeah, uh, I think he's a guy. He jumped in uh, back in, I want to say March uh, it was, but uh, six foot one, 180 pound uh, cornerback. Uh, Pitt went in home with him. Louisville uh, was a factor before he committed and after he committed as well. Uh, but I think he's a guy, when you watch the tape, he really jumps out on film. Um, so he'll get here in June uh, as well as uh, Lloyd Irvin uh, to kind of help uh, restock the future of that room. And going back to safety, one of the big gets for Maryland in the class, Brandon Jacob. Yeah, he was a guy that um, he kind of <laughs> was really committed early on the process, but um, really felt like in February, March, um, it really felt apparent that Maryland was kind of the, the school, the clear team to beat for him, uh, committed after his official visit. I remember talking to his dad and uh, it was he committed that Saturday night. Um, that was, I mean, it was a done deal. Uh, Miami tried everything they could to change their mind. Penn State tried very, very hard as well. Missouri was lurking very hard uh, on that as well. But um, again, Jacob really never showed signs of wavering. Um, and I posted it on the site, but uh, when Jacob came out and kind of reaffirmed his commitment and shut everything down, that was less about you know him back and forth about Maryland. It was more about just telling other coaches, just stop reaching out to me. So um, hell of a win. And uh, outside linebacker coach James Thomas deserves uh, all the credit on this one. He did, uh, he ran point on this from uh, beginning to end. So um, did, uh, did a really good job uh, locking Jacob down very early in the process. And now let's go to the front seven. Terps add a lot at the linebacker position. We'll start off with another guy from the state of Florida, Kiari James. Yeah, he's a guy, I believe this is his second year playing football, but um, finished with 124 tackles, 16 tackles for loss, five sacks and interception and four block kicks as a senior, um, the Canadian uh, native three-star recruit. Um, but he was a guy, I remember the day he visited uh, back in, I want to say, I want to say it was actually March 1st, uh, the first day possible for, for kids to be able to, to visit again. Um, Clearwater Academy had a couple guys that were on campus and uh, the immediate feedback on James was, you know, like beyond just what he already shown on film was he's a, an exceptional, exceptional, uh, <laughs> exceptional person as well. Um, and just the, again, the intangibles uh, to, to, to be a successful player um, that really uh, jumped out to them as well. So um, he's a guy with a very high ceiling, very coachable, um, seems like we'll, we'll talk about him next, I'm sure, but, you know, just very similar to Keyshawn Flowers, just in terms of the mindset, just uh, very result and just driven oriented. So uh, I think this is a guy that, that fans are going to um, see some plays from. You mentioned him, one of my favorite guys in the class on the defensive side of the ball from a school at the Terps, just keep making inroads. And, hey, maybe we'll have to talk a little uh, 2020. Yeah, 2025 uh, recruiting. Uh, with the quarterback coming out of the school from Spalding, uh, Keyshawn Flowers. Yeah, again, Maryland did a really good job recruiting him uh, between Brian Williams, defense coordinator, Lance Thompson, inside linebacker coach. Um, Miami was the biggest competitor, and Notre Dame was the third finalist there. But, uh, you know, I mentioned this way back when, Miami was just uh, – uh, they were a little too confident, honestly. They, they felt like, uh, you know, why doesn't he commit? Why won't he commit if – he has a great visit and it's like, he's not going to commit. That's not his plan for going into the visit with a plan to make him commit. He's not going to commit. So someone you're going to be disappointed and kind of fell on deaf ears. By the time the weekend ended, Miami was kind of knew that Maryland was a spot and uh, they tried to change his mind. But um, Keyshawn Flowers opted to stay local, uh, signed with Maryland where he and his young, his twin brother, excuse me, uh, Keon Flowers, uh, will head to Maryland. So uh, the 19th overall player uh, in the state of Maryland. Um, also had an offer from Alabama as well. Uh, finished with 81 tackles, 39 solo, uh, 11 tackles for loss, five sacks, two forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries. Just really, whenever you watch him, um, just always finds himself around the ball. Uh, and it, when he wraps up in space he's bringing you down uh, i think he's just a very good guy and again uh coach schmidt has nothing but good things to say about uh Keyshawn, the way he carries himself i think this is a really quality guy 
Yeah, and Spalding just building a really, really quality uh, football program here over the last five, six, seven years now. It's starting to produce a lot for the Terps. Uh, last guy in the class, Ahmed, Anthony Reddick. Yeah, he was one of the first guys who jumped in the fold, and I know I gave a shout-out to uh, Latrell Scott, so he deserves another shout-out here because, um, you know, right before Latrell Scott joined the fold, you kept hearing, you know, jumping in and really breaking into Virginia recruiting is an emphasis, and uh, I remember hearing – I remember actually before Latrell Scott joined, uh, joined the staff, uh, I was not optimistic on Reddick. It seemed like the, the interest, the contact was kind of – hot and cold kind of, you know, just really wasn't there. And uh, once, once Latrell Scott joined the fold and that kind of picked up and I uh, can't remember the date, but he took a visit and uh, about two days later told his family that he knew Maryland was a spot uh, opted to commit days later. Um, and now that he signed, uh, I have no problem sharing that he actually committed the morning of my best friend's wedding. And uh, we were trying to figure out the time and all that. And uh, then I look at my phone and, Anthony Reddick has announced, so I'm uh, I'm typing up a uh, commitment story while getting ready for a wedding. So that was fun. And if that says anything about our guy AG and, and the amount of work that he puts into the inside the black and gold, uh, nothing else will, Ahmed. It's been it's been a couple of days. I know every year this time it's so fun, uh, right around your birthday as well this year. So uh, you know, not taking much time off for it. No, I will say. I mean, it's been uh, it's kind of alarming me um but this is like the least stress that i've been around signing day probably in three four years which is so weird because maryland is a finalist in the 11th hour well i mean they were always in the mix but you know now a viable chance to get the signature of the biggest recruit since stefan diggs which is uh again i don't know how i got to this feeling but i'm not too mad about it so uh let's just let it ride and uh Maybe we'll have to do a special episode later this week. Yeah, I certainly hope so, because that would be it would be a lot of fun if the Terps uh, finish off the class. Ahmed, anything else to add on uh, National Signing Day? Yeah, I mean, Loxy talked about it. You know, I think he I think he actually mentioned it on the Big Ten Network. But I think that this, this class as a whole um, is just really um, – think this is going to be a class where you kind of look down the line and we talked about it before the the, the show uh, it's you can never project 100 percent uh and with say 100 percent certainty what's going to happen three four years in the modern era of college football but i think when you look at this class just from top to bottom i think they did a really good job just addressing a lot of these needs i'm a big fan of this offensive line hall uh, as a whole um you know i think a lot of people were you know maybe commit by commit, we're saying, oh, I don't know about him as a whole. But I think when you look at the big picture holistically, like this is, I think, a really good class. I think a lot of these guys, obviously, you have a chance if, you know, um, what we kind of think could happen comes to fruition and Maryland does add Jordan Seaton. And and, and when all said and done, I mean, this offensive line hall, if it is just Jordan Seaton, would be be an A+. plus. But if it's not Jordan Seaton, it's uh, it's still an excellent haul. Um, And and again, I think, look at the safety room, I just think, Merrill did a really good job addressing their needs. Um, when you look at the type of players that they have, the intangibles uh, and the modern era of the transfer portal, NIL and all that stuff. Um, I have everyone and their mother that t- reaches out to me and tells me, oh, Maryland NIL and can't be competitive. And every time I'll say, Maryland, if you, they, they're not going to recruit a kid who is just NIL. Uh, if it's the difference maker in the end, they'll deal with it. If they can't beat it. They can't beat it. But um, I think, the type of guys that you have in um, I think you have a chance to really um, see a very low attrition rate, which I think is very big and just continuing the culture, uh, continuing the the standard that Loxley always references uh, just really, really, I think this is a good class as a whole. Um, and I think, um, I think there's a chance obviously to, to reinforce that with the transfer portal. And obviously we'll see what happens with Jordan Seaton, as I mentioned it yet again, but um, nonetheless, I think this, this staff did a really good job. Um, and I think the stars and whatnot, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, Ernest Willore and um, you know, other, other stars that, you know, Maryland didn't sign or didn't really move on and things like that. But um, you know, I, I, I think Maryland has really always stayed true. Um, and if you really cover the program, you, you, know that Maryland's evaluation and stars and rankings, all that, those are two separate discussions. So I think that's a long answer. But again, I, I think that, uh, you know, when when signing day approaches, uh, Mike Loxley's classes always always come out good, but this might be his best class top to bottom uh, to date. 
Yeah, I was going to say pretty much the same thing, which is Mike Loxley, when he first started, said it's about laying the foundation. Well, as you all know, this is something that now, even more than ever, you see the most roster uh, attrition that there is with it. So you have to relay the foundation. When you look at this class, no, it's not packed with five stars, but Ahmed, you said, and I agree with it. There's nobody in here that to me at this point, a couple of them, you know, when they first signed, they were like, I don't know if that's really a reach. Looking at it as a whole, filling the needs that they need to fill. I don't see many guys that I'm like, that guy doesn't belong here. That guy can't develop into it. When your offensive line, look, we've had the guys that are the big star ratings that haven't produced. You got to take guys that they feel like are going to buy into the culture, the strength and conditioning program, and that are willing to be here for the three, the four, the five years into their careers where they can actually produce and play and be ready to play at a Big Ten level week in, week out, not have a great September, then start to get banged up and completely fall off. So when you look at it, it's a little bit of a different approach with the offensive line. I think it's a much needed change in perspective for what Coach Brass wants to do uh, with his position group. Ultimately, the defensive, the fill a ton of needs with the defensive backfield, which they really need to reload out. Of course, they're going to get great skill position guys. And look, it's all about evaluation and getting guys that are going to buy into your culture right now because, look, everybody says it and everybody loves to complain about it, but it is true day in and day out. If you don't recruit for culture anymore, those guys are going to jump in the portal after half a season, a full season, a redshirt year. You're really limited in what you can do to get buy-in, so you have to recruit the guys that you feel like are going to fit what you're building. Yeah, uh, you hit the nail right on the head there. So, um, yeah, uh, again, uh, I think that it just, you know, it, it comes out really well. But um didn't get the chance to ask Locks if he was done yet. So uh, I guess we're just going to have to wait till Friday night. But I hope we don't have to wait that long. Yeah, I, well, <laughs> Friday night or February. I don't know. I'll take Friday night. Oh, no. If, uh, okay, I have no problem saying this. If this goes beyond Friday night, like everything needs to be reset. This is it's a whole new ball game. So like the, I'm moving forward with the expectation that Jordan Seaton is signing this week. If he does not, that it's it's a brand new ball game because that's two and a half more months. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know that I'd have the same confidence uh, and we'll see if the tune changes. But uh, again, this week, fingers yeah. crossed. We need that. I wait till like 3 a.m. on uh, Thursday when he just decides to pull the trigger somewhere. Just. Yeah. Uh, absolutely random with my sleep schedule i'll be up so uh you know again you know i've had my phone right next to me i told jordan seat or uh, i didn't tell jordan seaton i joked on the forum jordan seaton is still welcome to, to commit and any time during this episode but uh we'll, we'll we'll wait so uh friday night's the deadline well you heard it here first whether it's at 3 a.m or sometime that makes a lot more sense on friday ahmed will have your coverage of whatever goes on with anything that's added to Maryland's uh, 2023 class, whenever it happens on inside the black and gold.net. Yeah, absolutely, man. So we'll uh, definitely dive in and uh, see how it all unfolds. As always like this pod, wherever you get it, subscribe to it, wherever you get it, leave us a rating, a review. It helps us out here on the show for Ahmed Gafir. I am Mason Viner. And as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.